Good morning. It's still morning. Uh, thank you so much. It's, it really is an honor and a pleasure to be here and uh, appreciate the invitation. I'd like to talk today about the role of trauma and PTSD in eating and related disorders. And I think many of the speakers that have uh, preceded me have really set me up very well. Uh, David Rubino's comments about context I think are very important, uh, stress, uh, and so on. Uh, I was in psychiatric residency at UC San Francisco in uh, 78 to 82, and right smack in the middle of my residency, DSM-3 came out in 1980, and two new disorders were introduced. Bulimia, <clears throat> which was new to the scene of psychiatric diagnosis, and PTSD, also, first time ever. Uh, and little did I know then that these two would end up being intimately related. Now, trauma, of course, is a very ubiquitous experience, and people have different definitions of it. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about today is really what I like to call big T trauma. Big T trauma basically meaning an experience that leads to possible PTSD or partial PTSD or subclinical PTSD. Uh, I really like a recent definition put out by SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Association. Trauma is basically defined by three E's. It is not just the event which is certainly important, but it's the experience of the event along with the effect of that event and experience. And hence, we have the effects uh, basically in the form of PTSD. So uh, when I was uh, doing eating disorders and, and researching eating disorders, uh, there was very little, again, in this crossover between PTSD, trauma, and eating disorders. And it wasn't until 1986 that the first um, report of childhood sexual abuse was published about uh, bulimia nervosa in relationship to bulimia nervosa. It was also around that time in the mid-80s that childhood sexual abuse was reported to be in association with addiction and drug abuse. So it was around the same time that these relationships, interrelationships, began to, to emerge in the literature. Now, uh, when I went to the Medical University of South Carolina and I began to set up an eating disorder program, uh, I started seeing a lot of patients and I started supervising a lot of uh, trainees and, and other therapists treating patients. And I was an uh, in inpatient attending and I kept seeing clinically trauma, 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 trauma. Yet when I looked, went, looked in uh, the literature, there was really nothing uh, about this. And in fact, the literature said that there was pretty much no relationship, the, the existing literature at that time. So um, I'm kind of an inbred skeptic. Uh, I said, this can't be right. And so I uh, <clears throat> situated myself to work with uh, folks at the National Crime Victims Research and Treatment Center who happened to be doing the National Women's Study. And we were able to get a number of questions in there to assess for eating disorders in the third wave of the National a women's study. And what we found was really revolutionary at the time, uh, which we published in 1997, which is that the rates of completed rape were significantly higher in those uh, women who met criteria for bulimia nervosa compared to the non-bulimic women. And this was a representative sample. This was a non-clinical, non-treatment seeking sample. So we we're able to generalize somewhat to the U United States population. We also found that uh, context sexual molestation was significantly higher, almost twice as high, and previously unreported was that aggravated assault was three times higher than what occurred in the general population. And these are actually defined as crimes of violence against women. And uh, looking at any of these direct victimization experiences, over half of this non-treatment seeking representative sample of women had one or more of these experiences in their life. Now, violence is common uh, against women, no doubt about it, occurring uh, in about one-third of uh, women. We were able to furthermore show that in 84% of cases, uh, the rape came first before the first binge, Not, never mind the meeting criteria for bulimia, but before the, even the first binge, the, the trauma predated 
the onset of the eating disorder. So we were able to then say that this is a uh, uh, <coughs> causative risk factor. Now, uh, pr prior to that, there had been a number of reports about trauma and, and bulimia and eating disorders that were mixed. And I think part of the problem is they weren't, they were looking at the event, but they weren't looking at the experience and the effect uh, of the event and the experience, i.e. PTSD and PTSD symptoms. So here's a good example. When you look at uh, those women who were raped who developed PTSD, their rate of developing bulimia nervosa, lifetime history, is 10.4%. But if you had rape and did not develop PTSD, it was absolutely no different than women who'd never been raped at all. So we all experience trauma in a very different way, and that's where genes come in uh, and other factors. So moving on to PTSD, there are now uh, two major uh, national representative samples that give us information about this in eating disorders. The National Women's Study, which I just told you about, and also the National Comorbidity Survey Replication, which was just published in 2007. Uh, Obviously, the, the National Women's Study is just women. The National Comorbidity Survey is both men and women. And we see inordinately high rates of PTSD uh, compared to the general population. Uh, in the National Women's Study, it was 37.5%. Uh, in the National Comorbidity Survey, it was uh, upwards of 43, 44%. And we see also higher rates of PTSD in binge eating disorder as well. Uh, compared to the normal population. The odds ratio de of developing uh, PTSD, lifetime PTSD, in individuals with bulimia nervosa is 10.2. For binge eating disorder, 5.1. Any binging, <coughs> subclinical form of, of binging, 4.0. Whereas anorexia nervosa, it's not significantly different, 1.6. Now, in the paper, they did not di differentiate them between bulimic uh, or, or purging type of, of anorexia, but I've got the data set, I've gone back. The majority of these anorexics are restrictor type. They're two-thirds restrictor. So this is a story about bulimic eating disorders. It's not a story about anorexia restricting, okay? It's very clear, the literature, that trauma and PTSD are higher in the bulimic forms of eating disorders, uh, including uh, binge purge anorexia, binge eating disorder, bulimia nervosa, and subclinical forms, and it's not about restricting anorexia nervosa. So big T trauma, though, of course, leads to PTSD, and this is certainly not a specific risk factor for eating disorders, hardly. We know now uh, that there's been an enormous amount of data over the last 30, 35 years showing that PTSD is a major risk factor for just about all forms of psychopathology. When I was a resident up the coast, uh, you know, I learned about the schizophrenogenic mother, uh, Frieda Fromm Reichman, right? And uh, pretty much research has shown that trauma is related to just about every other psychopathology but schizophrenia, from eating disorders, substance abuse, mood, anxiety, dissociative somatoform, impulse control, disruptive behavior disorders, and cluster B personality disorders. They're all higher, okay? So this may give you a presage of what I'm going to talk about now, which is comorbidity. So we uh, have a lot of data that's accumulated uh, in psych psychiatry and psychology that clearly shows that trauma and the experience of trauma and the effects of trauma leads to PTSD in people who have a genetic predisposition toward it. And we know that there is a biology to PTSD, a genetics to PTSD, just like everything else. Uh, Dr. Weinberger talked about every psychiatric disorder has a genetic predisposition, liability. But that interacts with genes. Uh, <clears throat> genetics loads the gun, environment pulls the trigger. Uh, you probably heard that before. And that is buffered by social support. What your support system is at the time of trauma and the response to that uh, event, right, modulates the experience of that event and the effect of it, which then uh, will lead to PTSD or, or partial PTSD or not, which then is a major modulator to comorbidity, okay? So uh, I want to say that I want to point out one study that got me very interested in the food addiction uh, issue and led me to actually end up editing this book, which I uh, 
uh, I am going to be given unabash unabashedly uh, plugged for my book that's co-edited. There are lots of folks uh, in the room and here that have contributed. Uh, Nicole Lavina, for one, Ashley Gerhardt, uh, Mark Gohl helped write the uh, preface. I've got flyers and coupons uh, <laughs> for 20% off. But what got me really interested in this study that I got asked to review by the Journal of Women's Health, and uh, it showed that in a large group of women studied at a Texas medical clinic, that PTSD and its symptoms were associated with binging and purging, which we knew already uh, from a lot of data. But for the first time, it was uh, uh, connected PTSD symptoms with eating a type of food that uh, PTSD and hence traumatic experience were, were linked to higher frequencies of ingesting uh, hyperpalatable foods, fast foods and, and sugary sodas, okay, which really got my attention and, that, and also got me interested in the food addiction issue. Uh, and I've really become a believer because I think that's what the science is really indicating. Uh, recently, there have been published just in the, in the last year or so uh, studies. There's... Uh, Pointer disappeared. Okay. Different studies that have uh, linked food addiction with uh, trauma. Uh, Mason in Obesity last year published uh, studies linking different forms of abuse, particularly the, the most uh, severe malignant forms of abuse, sexual abuse, forced rape, and severe physical abuse. The, the increased dose of abuse is associated with higher rates of, on the food Yale food addiction scale. All right, very clearly, you can see that on the left slide. On the right sl uh, slide, just this year in JAMA Psychiatry, we have those with trauma and PTSD have the highest rates of obesity over time. And both of these studies come from the, the uh, National Nurses Study, uh, second wave. So, and, and I know that there are data percolating and in, in, uh, in, in have been submitted that link uh, food addiction uh, levels with PTSD. So in summary, you know, the comorbidity between bulimic spectrum eating disorders and substance use disorders addictions may be in large part due to a history of big T trauma and resultant PTSD or partial PTSD. And this relationship with, between bulimic eating disorders and addictions and PTSD are particularly strong among men. Uh, for some reason, my, I lost that slide. But uh, it's supposed to be right there. But it shows basically results from the National Rep, uh, Comorbidity Replication that if you have both uh, PTSD and an eating disorder, that the rates of any substance abuse are significantly higher. And this is particularly true in men with rates as high as 88%, again, in this representative sample. So if you're a man and you've been traumatized and you develop an eating disorder, you are almost going to have a, 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 an addiction of some sort of, uh, along with it. So uh, the thing about it is even though residential treatment facilities all over the country and inpatient facilities who treat eating disorders and addictions are full of patients with comorbidity, multiple comorbid disorders. It used to be dual diagnosis when I was a resident. Now it's quadruple, you know, you, you know how many diagnoses, multi-diagnoses. Uh, very complicated cases, as, as uh, Dina uh, mentioned earlier at Rosewood. Every, every residential program in the country is like this. Uh, these are the folks who don't respond to typical outpatient interventions. Uh, we don't really know exactly how to treat them. There are no exact studies or, or controlled trials on how to treat these complicated comorbid uh, patients. We have some guidelines, but uh, there's, there needs to be a lot more attention uh, to this uh, group in terms of treatment. But I think these results add to the considerable body of literature indicating these very, very powerful links between trauma and the resultant effects of trauma, PTSD and its symptoms, with uh, eating disorders and substance use disorders. And by the way, PTSD has now been shown to be linked to all of the leading causes of death in the United States. It's not just psychiatric disorders. It's all of medical disorders are higher in those with a lifetime history of, uh, of cancer and, and severe childhood adversity. Um, diabetes, obesity, uh, cancer, arthritis, heart disease. Uh, it's pretty incredible when you see the data. 
Uh, so as I put it together, uh, trauma serves as an organizing principle when you're thinking about etiology from a biopsychosocial and developmental perspective. And the more psychiatric comorbidity there is, chances are the more likely big T trauma played a role in precipitating the overall course. Uh, big T trauma-related disorders probably share common underlying factors that account for such interrelationships, i.e. dysregulation in these neuropsychobiological mechanisms and, uh, and, and uh, circuits that are triggered by gene expression that underlies affective or mood dysregulation. And then common cognitive schemas involving issues of self-esteem, control, guilt, and shame. These are what you see across diagnoses, uh, very much in spades. So with that, uh, oh, that didn't come out well, well at all. That's supposed to be clear in the mi middle. So sorry about that. Thank you very much. 14 seconds, not there. <laughs>